And All right, Capo, we're going to get started. All right, Capo, do I, can I have your attention, please? Thank you. So good afternoon. My name is Ryan, and today, and actually this week, I'm going to be attempting to lecture you guys on Akadec Econ. Now, before we start, can you guys give a big hand of applause to Sandra? She made some of the graphs that you'll see on this presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, Sandra. And so let's get started. Um, section one, fundamental economic concepts. All right. Okay, so the five assumptions and concepts that underlies most economic models and formulas are scarcity, opportunity costs, rationality, gains from trade, and trade-offs. Scarcity is the idea that all resources are limited and our desires are, are unlimited. So the thing with scarcity is that we have to make an efficient choice on how we're going to allocate our scarce resources to satisfy most of our unlimited desires. Opportunity cost is similar to trade-off, except opportunity cost is the next best thing you gave up to do what you're doing. For example, right now, you could have the option to listen to my lecture, reading a book, or go sleep. Um, let's say you rank li listening to this lecture as most valuable and going to sleep the next and reading a book the last, then attending this lecture, your opportunity costs would be sleeping. And speaking of trade-offs, trade-offs is basically the concept that when you make a choice, you have to give up something else. So again, back to my example earlier, if you were to attend this lecture, then you give up the time to read, to play games, or to take a nap. Um, rationality assumes that people think rationally. So people would make a loose calculation on the costs and benefits of doing something and really loosely will choose the options that give us the best benefits. Note that most of the times on a day-to-day -day basis, we don't go in and calculate these values specifically. We just do like we just do it like intuitively without thinking too much about it. And gains from trade uh, explains that when we specialize in what we are best at doing and we trade, we're able to gain more than we can if we just did everything by ourselves. Next, economic models. So in e economics, we use a lot of diagrams and formulas. And these diagrams or formulas are kind of simple because they allow us to focus on the effects of changing one variable. So this could be sometimes hard to understand like why things happen in economic theory. And I think most of it comes down to because sometimes it's just so simplified, it's harder to understand. Positive versus normative economics. So positive economics is just an objective statement on causes and effects of things going on in the economy. So for example, a positive economic statement would be like um, raising the minimum wage by two dollars caused increase in structural unemployment and normative economics adds value judgments on top of economic analysis and a key word to always look out for when looking for normative economic statements is the word should so for example should the government raise taxes should the minimum wage be raised and other similar analysis will be normative economics. Pareto efficiency. So Pareto efficiency was created by an Italian economist named Vilfredo Pareto. And so Pareto efficiency is basically a distribution in which all resources are allocated. Pareto efficiency doesn't care how you distribute those resources. As long as all of it is distributed nothing is wasted, it is Pareto efficient. So you can have everything go to one person or everything shared equally to everybody. That, that is all Pareto efficiency. 
So we had to use normative economics to make the call to which type of allocation is most efficient and most desirable for our society. Now, microeconomics versus macroeconomics. So microeconomics focuses on individual markets and behaviors. So for example, the chicken nugget markets, monopolies and price elasticity are all part of things that microeconomists look at. Macroeconomics focuses on the national level. So we talk about things like unemployment, inflation, GDP, and foreign exchange rate. Section two, microeconomics. So the law of demand states that when prices go down, quantity demanded goes up and vice versa. And it explains that the relationship between price and quantity demanded is inverse because as things get cheaper, you tend to buy more. And so a demand schedule lists an individual's quantity demanded at every possible price. And when you combine everyone in the market, their demand schedule, you get the demand curve, which you see on the screen right here. And now the law of supply. The law of supply explains a positive relationship between price and quantity supplied. So as prices go up, quantity supplied goes up as well, because if you can sell a good at a higher price, you get more revenue. And as a supplier, your goal is to gain as much revenue as you can. And so same thing with demand, a supply schedule lists an individual firm's quantity supplied at every price. And if you combine all the suppliers of a market, their, their supply schedule, you get this thing on the graph called the supply curve. And so yeah, market is when, market is a place where all the buyers and sellers come together. And so if you look at the graph, you would see your demand and your supply curve. Um, some markets like the New York Stock Exchange are really organized where they have an auctioneer that brings together the sellers and buyers and set a price. Other markets like your regular supermarket are less formal and so on. And so recognize this intersection of the supply and demand curves, that's your equilibrium point. And so in a highly competitive market, this will be the point of your quantity and the point of your price. And we'll talk more about equilibrium later when we get to the topic of competitive markets. And so now we talk about factors that shift the demand curve. So number of buyers, price of related goods, tastes, expectations of future prices and income all shifts the demand curve left or right. Uh, talking about the first one, number of buyers, this one's a little bit easier to understand, right? The more buyers you have, the more demand you will have. So as the number of buyers increase, your demand curve will shift to the right. Price of related goods. Um, so before I go into that, I will talk about substitutes and complements. So substitutes are goods that can be substituted. So for example, like tuna and salmon, you can get one or the other. Uh, the other is complements, which is like goods that go together. So like hot dogs and hot dog buns. Unless you're weird and you don't eat the hot dog buns with the hot. But yeah. So substitutes. When the price of the substitute goes down, the demand for the good that we're interested in, that shifts to the left because people will buy the cheaper substitute. For complements, if the price of the complement goes down, the demand for our good in question shifts to the right because it's now cheaper to get the complement. And taste, taste is like how people feel about the good, kind of like sentiments. So if sentiment towards the good is good, is better than usual, your demand curve will shift to the right. And if, for example, the government creates programs that advocates the prevention of using drugs, then the demand curve on the market for drugs will shift to the left. And expectations of future prices. If people feel in the future prices will be lower, your demand curve will shift to the left for now because 
they will they will save up their money to buy the cheaper good in the future. And on the same hand, if they expect prices to be higher in the future, they will spend more now because they want to buy the good while it's still cheaper. And income. Um, if your if the good in question is a normal good, then a rise in income will bring the demand curve to the right. But if it's an inferior good, then a rise in income will bring your demand curve to the left. All right. And now factors that shift the supply curve and ignore the title. Um, but yeah, factors that shift the supply curve, numbers of sellers, input prices, technology, expectations of future prices, and prices of related goods. Uh, number of sellers, same thing like with the buyers. The more sellers you have, you have more supply, so that shifts to the right. Input prices. Input prices are basically things that a firm has to buy in order to make their goods. So for example, labor, electricity, land. So if input prices goes up, your supply curve shifts to the left. And technology. Technology shifts uh, shifts supply curve to the right. And the USAID guide that talks about the growth bovine hormone, which is something that they use to get cows to produce more milk, I think. So technology allows us to be more productive. And so as a result, it shifts supply curve to the right. And expectations of future prices. This is kind of the opposite of the expectations for demand curve. If suppliers feel prices will be higher in the future, they will sell less now. So when the prices are higher later, they can sell more. And if they feel prices will be lower in the future, they will sell more now. So when the prices do drop, they don't have to sell as much. And price of related goods, this is kind of similar to um, the factors for demand, except you're looking at it through the point of a supplier. And don't worry if you don't understand this because you wouldn't learn it in um, Academic Econ, I don't think. But basically it's a firm, they have to choose what to sell. So if two goods are like substitutes of production, it means they can produce this or that, right? So for example, maybe like, um, what's a good example? So maybe like beef, right? A firm can decide with beef, they can either make a beef noodle soup or beef patties. So those two will be the substitutes. And let's say that beef patties generate more revenue. Then it means the supply curve for beef noodle soup will shift to the left because firms will want to make the beef patties instead. And complements in production will be something like, um, let's see. Mm, maybe like, mm, let me think about this. Uh, maybe like chicken salad and eggs. So if like chicken eggs become more expensive, then, then your chicken salad supply curve will shift to the right because now because chickens make both chicken salad and eggs. So complements, if the other complements get more expensive, then the complement good supply will shift to the right as well. All right, price elasticity of demand. So the price of elasticity of demand measures the responsiveness of quantity demanded based on a change in price and factors that influence price elasticity is market definition, time, substitutes, necessities, and luxuries. And market definition is just something really simple. For example, if you're talking about a market for soda, that will have a more elastic demand than if you were to talk about a market with a market of, for example, soft drinks. And this kind of goes hand in hand with substitutes because soda, there's like a lot more substitutes than soft drinks. And time, uh, elasticity is usually more inelastic when the time range is shorter because people have less time to react to the changes in price. As you give more time, people have more opportunities to change their spending habits 
So in the in the longer time span, demand is more elastic. Um, necessities and luxury luxuries. Necessities tend to have really short, really inelastic demand because there's really nothing else you can really get besides that good. And luxuries, on the other hand, tend to be really elastic because you can survive without them. And they're really just something to have if you have more than you need. And so to calculate the price elasticity of demand, you find a percent change in quantity demanded and divide that by the percent change in price. And here are the five types of elasticity. On the very left with the straight line, this is a perfectly inelastic demand. And on the second one, it's inelastic where it's really steep, but not, not, not a vertical line. And in the middle here, you have unit elastic. And that's basically when a 1% change in price leads to a 1% change in quantity demanded. And right next to that, you have an elastic curve, which is less steep than unit elastic, but not horizontal. And when you have a demand curve that is perfectly horizontal, you have perfectly elastic. Now, price elasticity of supply. Like the price elasticity for demand, it measures the responsiveness of quantity supplied based on a change in price. Factors that influence price elasticity, ease to entry and exit of the market, time, substitutes, and scarcity of resources. Supply is more elastic if the ease to enter and exit the market um, is easier because it's easy for firms to just come in and come out. Uh, time, again, like demand, as, time, as the time span increases, supply is more elastic because suppliers have more time to make different choices. Um, substitutes, again, like what I talked about earlier, and scarcity of resources. If a firm produces something that's really scarce or uses a resources that are really scarce, then it means that their supply will be very inelastic because it's hard for it's hard for other suppliers to use that resource. And so really similar to demand, you calculate uh, price elasticity by finding the percent change in quantity supplied and divide that by the percent change in price. And a quick note here I will mention is that price elasticity is positive because supply curve is upward sloping, while for demand, it will be negative because of the inverse relationship between price and quantity demand. And so again, you have your five types of elasticity. A, per, a straight vertical line is perfectly inelastic. A really steep line will be inelastic. Unit elastic, same thing, 1% change in supply is caused by 1% change in price and elastic and perfectly elastic. All right, so actually that gone by a lot quicker than expected, but yeah, this will be the end of day one. Does anyone have any questions, comments, or suggestions? Yes, Lan? Yeah, so if you guys didn't hear, um, feel free to ask Lan or any one of the seniors if you guys have any questions on econ, we'll be really glad to help you guys out. Uh, anyone on Zoom, do you guys have questions? Zoom, questions? <laughs> uh, none, none for me. No questions? All righty. All right, then you guys can feel free to log off. Thank you for hosting the session. I will be posting the recording shortly later. Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you.